ME204, Angular Impulse and Momentum of Rigid Bodies. We've talked about impulse and momentum of a particle, and we've defined linear momentum, linear impulse, angular or rotational momentum, and angular impulse. We've then taken those pieces and put them together into an impulse and momentum equation. We have linear impulse and momentum as well as angular impulse and momentum, and these are represented by two separate equations. So what happens when we have a rigid body? First, let's look at impulse and momentum for pure rotation of a rigid body. If we take our equation, force equals mass times acceleration, and look at it for an object that's rotating, we've already established that we can say from that that a moment is equal to our mass moment of inertia times an angular acceleration. But angular acceleration is equal to a change in our angular velocity with respect to time. If we substitute that into our equation, and then rearrange the equation so that our time goes over to the side with the moment, and then integrate both sides, we end up with a moment times a change in time, if our moment is constant, is equal to our mass moment of inertia times the final angular velocity minus the mass moment of inertia times the initial angular velocity. Or if we rearrange it, our initial angular momentum plus a moment times a change in time equals the final angular momentum. Now let's look at the derivation of the angular impulse and momentum equation for general plane motion. So now instead of just having pure rotation, we're going to have rotation and translation. Many times we can characterize this by shifting our mass moment of inertia to the point of rotation. In this case, we have our mass moment of inertia about the point O. We write our equation for pure rotation, and then knowing that our mass moment of inertia about a shifted point is related to our mass moment of inertia of the center of gravity by the parallel axis theorem, if we substitute that into our equation, and then distribute our angular velocity through that equation, and noting that our translational velocity is equal to our angular velocity times a distance d, substituting that into the equation, and then canceling d1 on the left side of the equation and a d2 on the right side of the equation, we end up with this equation, that our mass moment of inertia about the center of gravity times our angular velocity plus our mass times the translational velocity times a distance plus a moment times a change in time equals our mass moment of inertia about the center of gravity times our final angular velocity plus the mass times our final velocity times a distance. Now let's put it all together. So for linear impulse and momentum we have our initial momentum plus an impulse which is a force times a change in time is equal to our final momentum and if our force is variable then we would need to integrate the force with respect to time. For angular impulse and momentum we have our our initial rotational momentum plus the translational momentum times a distance plus a moment times a change in time which is our angular impulse is equal to our final rotational momentum plus our translational momentum times a distance. Note that that distance d1 and d2 need to be perpendicular to the velocity vector from the point of rotation. If our moment is variable then we integrate our moment with respect to time to find what our angular impulse would be. Let's look at kinetic energy versus momentum so that we can distinguish between the two. We'll look at it for both translating and rotating objects. Kinetic energy is equal to one half the mass times the velocity squared for the translating portion and we can add to that the one half times the mass moment of inertia times the angular velocity squared. For momentum, a translating object is represented by a mass times a velocity vector. Angular momentum, however, is the mass times the velocity vector crossed with a perpendicular distance. This again is a vector and we can determine the direction of this by using the right hand rule. This is valid when a mass is concentrated at a distance or for the translational component of a rigid body experiencing general plane motion. If we have a mass of 5 kilograms that's 2 meters out from the point of rotation then we would use our mass times the velocity vector crossed with the perpendicular distance to find out what the angular momentum of that mass would be. What if the mass is distributed around the pivot point? It's not concentrated at a certain distance. Or what if we're looking at the rotational component of a rigid body experiencing general plane motion, like a disc that's rotating? In this case, our angular momentum is the mass moment of inertia times the angular velocity. So for a concentrated mass or the translational component of a rotating body, we would use our moment of momentum, which is a mass times the velocity times the perpendicular distance. And for a distributed mass, we would use our mass moment of inertia times the angular velocity.
Let's look at work versus impulse for translating and rotating objects. Linear work is equal to a force times a change in position. Rotational work is a moment times an angle in radians. For an impulse, we have a force vector times a change in time. For rotational impulse, we have a moment times a change in time. And that moment can be represented as a vector as well. So for work and energy, we have our initial energy plus the work done by all the forces is equal to our final energy. Note that our initial energy includes the linear and rotational kinetic energy, and our final energy includes the linear and rotational kinetic energy. All of our work includes linear and rotational work. This can all be put into one equation. For impulse and momentum, our linear impulse and momentum equation has our initial momentum plus an impulse equals our final momentum. For angular impulse and momentum, we have a separate equation where we have our mass moment of inertia times our initial angular velocity plus our mass times velocity times perpendicular perpendicular distance plus a moment times a change in time equals our mass moment of inertia times our final angular velocity plus a mass times the final velocity times a perpendicular distance. Note that linear and rotational effects are combined in one equation for work and energy, but in impulse and momentum, linear and rotational effects are treated separately. Note that there's a difference in the units and the vector directions. All terms for our linear impulse and momentum equation are in the units of kilograms meters per second. But if we look at the units for angular impulse and momentum, all the terms are in the units of kilograms meters squared per second. So we can't combine these two equations together. We have to treat linear and angular impulse and momentum separately. So in summary, for the things that we have covered in this course, when we're talking about translation, S is a linear position. For rotation, theta is an angular position. V represents a linear velocity, and omega is an angular velocity. A is a linear acceleration. Alpha is an angular acceleration. From Newton's second law, a force causes a mass to accelerate, or force equals mass times acceleration. For rotation, Newton's second law is that a moment is equal to the mass moment of inertia times an angular acceleration. For kinetic energy, we have one half the mass times the velocity squared. For rotation, in kinetic energy, we have one half the mass moment of inertia times the angular velocity squared. Translational work is a force times a change in position. Rotational work is a moment times an angle. Translational momentum is a mass times velocity. Rotational or angular momentum is a mass times a velocity times a distance or a moment of momentum. Or an angular momentum is our mass moment of inertia times an angular velocity. An impulse is a force times a change in time, and for rotation, an angular impulse is a moment times the change in time. Here's some examples. Let's say that we've got a 20 kilogram spool that has a radius of 0.2 meters, and we apply a constant force of 58.8 newtons downward for 3 meters starting from rest, and we're going to assume the pulley is a disc. We want to know what the angular velocity of the pulley is after it's been pulled down those 3 meters. Now, since this equation is asking for a velocity, and the relationship that it gives us is with respect to a distance, we're going to use energy to solve this problem. So we write out our energy equation. Initially, it starts from rest, so there's no rotational or translational energy, and in the end, the spool is not translating, so my translation energy is also zero. So my equation is a force times a change in position is equal to one half the mass moment of inertia times the angular velocity squared. Solving for my mass moment of inertia for a disk it's one half the mass times the radius squared which in this case will be equal to 0 0.4 and substituting that into my equation and solving for omega I get an angular velocity of 29.7 radians per second. But what if I have the same problem but I pull it down for three seconds starting from rest instead of three meters. Since we're looking for a velocity and it's with respect to a force being applied for three seconds we're going to use impulse and momentum. However we have a rotational component in this so let's try angular impulse and momentum. Here's my equation for angular impulse and momentum. The object starts from rest so there's no translational or rotational component. In the end, the spool is not translating, so my translational component is also zero. So here's the final equation that I'm going to use. My moment times a change in time is equal to my mass moment of inertia times the angular velocity. We've already determined my mass moment of inertia, so substituting in the values that we know, we have a force of 58.8 newtons, and its perpendicular distance to the point of rotation is 0.2 meters, and that will constitute our moment. So we have a moment times a change in time of 3 seconds, is equal to 0.4 times our angular velocity. 
gives us an angular velocity of 88.2 radians per second. Now what if instead of having a force of 58.8 newtons, we have a block that weighs 58.8 newtons, and it's pulled down for 3 meters. Again, we're going to use work and energy since we're dealing with a distance. Now I've got some potential energy due to elevation, and in the end I'm going to have translational energy from the block. Initially, there's no kinetic energy, and there's no external work in this system. So here's my final equation. Again, my mass moment of inertia is 0.4 for the spool, and I know that the velocity of the block is equal to the angular velocity times the radius of the spool. Substituting these into our equation and filling it in with what we know, we have one unknown, our angular velocity, and solving for the angular velocity, we get 23.5 radians per second. What if we have the same problem again with a block that's 58.8 newtons, and we allow it to drop for three seconds starting from rest, and we want to know what the angular velocity of the disk is. Again, we'll use angular impulse and momentum. Here's our equation. The object starts from rest, so there's no rotational or or translational components to be involved. However, in the end, we will have a block that has momentum in addition to the disk that's rotating. So this will be our final equation that we'll use. Now we need to account for the rotation of the disk, but we also need to account for the translation of the block. And we can use angular momentum by taking the moment of momentum of the block about the point of rotation. Substituting in what we know, our moment again is the 58.8 newtons times a radius of 0.2 meters, and times that by our 3 seconds to get our angular impulse. That will be equal to our mass moment of inertia, 0.4 times the angular velocity, plus the mass of the block, which is translating, 6 kilograms, times its velocity, times the perpendicular distance to the point of rotation, which is 0.2. We also know that the velocity of the block is equal to our angular velocity times the radius, and substituting that in and solving, we get an angular velocity of 55.1 radians per second. So, let's explain the difference. Why is there a difference between the applied force of 58.8 newtons and the force supplied by the block or the weight of the block that was 58.8 newtons. We ended up with different angular velocities. The difference is because our block in the second problem will have energy associated with it. The force that's applied in the first problem is only applied for that three meters and then is no longer part of the problem. Whereas the block in the second half is part of the problem and will have energy associated with it. The energy of the system includes the energy of the block. So our angular velocity goes down the same is true with respect to momentum. In our initial problem, we have 58.8 newtons being applied as a force, and so our angular velocity becomes higher than it would be if it were a block. All of the momentum is put into the spool. On the second part of the problem, when we have the block, both the spool and the block have to account for that momentum, and so our angular velocity is decreased. Our next topic is conservation of angular momentum, rigid body kinetics.